This is the story of Throch the Cunning, read by Benjamin T. Milnes. There was once a troll whose name was Throch. Like all trolls, Throch was not beautiful. The skin of his face was ashen and his eyes and mouth were prunish. His thighs were mottled yellow with clumped fat and his gnarled hands dripped with black snot. Throch, however, thought himself truly stunning to look at. He was bald, like all trolls, but each day smeared a sod of piss-stained straw in his head. He also had a taste for costly and garish clothing and jewellery, which he acquired from ethelings and thanes he met on the road. I would not say that Throch was wise, but he was cunning, far more so than most trolls. He had a knowledge of what he wanted and had at some point stumbled upon a way of getting it. You see, Throch did not acquire these gifts from the ethelings and thanes he met by threatening them in the way that most trolls do. No, Throch had a way with words. After speaking with the ethelings, reeves and thanes for a few minutes, they gladly gave him an ermine coat or a gold ring or a bottle of perfume. The tale, I will tell you, happened in the 18th year of the reign of King Ethelred. Ethelred was a truly great king. His grandfather, King Edric, had usurped the throne from King Cunneric, and within two years after being crowned had killed any reeve or thane who so much as whispered malcontent. His son and Ethelred's father, King Edrith, had continued to remove any disloyal lords, and as such, when Ethelred came to the throne at 24 years old, he was completely unopposed in the royal court. Gruesome though his father and grandfather were, the peaceful upbringing that the young Ethelred had gave him much time for reading the great histories of the land and disquisitions on mathematics and medicine. And so, by the time his father died, he was knowledgeable on the kings of the past, and a great many other things. Thus, Ethelred quickly showed himself to be a wise king. In the first five years of his reign, he commissioned the writing of a handbook describing the latest innovations in agriculture, which was then copied and distributed to all of the towns in the kingdom. He also designed a new type of device for foretelling the seasons. Ethelred also believed that anyone, absolutely anyone, should be able to speak their mind on any matter without persecution. He believed that good ideas could come from anyone, not just those of nobility. Thus he wanted to hear what everyone had to say. Two years into his reign, he decreed that no one may attack another just because of something they've said. And by the time of this story, the people of the kingdom had adjusted to this. And so Ethelred became known as a wise king. His father and grandfather had ruled through strength, and so no one had dared to oppose them. But with Ethelred, who ruled through wisdom, no one wanted to oppose him. But though Ethelred was wise, he was not cunning, as Throch was. And this, it seemed, was his undoing when it came to the troll. No one knows what Throch did for the first thirty years of his miserable life. It's assumed that he did what most trolls do, hassle men and women, mostly women it always is with trolls, who travelled from town to town along muddy roads. He stole food and sat in sodden earth by the roadside, tearing chunks off it with his yellow teeth. And at some point, and I've no idea how, he learned the wordcraft that won him the praise of wealthier travellers. And one day, he must have decided that he wanted something more than a dirty life in the ditches and stale ponds of the kingdom, because he decided to come to the king's castle. As you can imagine, when Throch first plodded up to the south gate to the town that surrounded the castle, the people walking along the road to and from the town were quite disgusted by him. Slime from the ponds he had slept in still clung to his now copper-green ermine cloak. Although it should be said that one thing they weren't disgusted by quite so much was the smell. All trolls stink, of course. Interestingly, no two trolls smell exactly alike, but they all smell of some mixture of rotten chicken, 
blue cheese, oil paint that's been mixed with water and left to stand for a month, apricot, bizarrely, though it has little effect on the overall aroma, vomit and shit. All trolls, that is, except for Throch. You see, Throch liked fragrances, all kinds. Many of the lords and ladies who met him upon the road, sitting in their ornate carriages, said later that the one thing Throch asked them for the most was perfume. What Throch did not have, however, was a good taste in fragrances. He would drench himself with every fragrance he owned at once. This resulted in an overpowering concoction that left most gasping for the stale air of a sewer. But it was redeemed in that it was better than what trolls usually smell of. The king's castle and the town around it are surrounded by a great wall. It is fifteen feet high and seven feet thick. There are only three ways through it, the north gate, the west gate, and the south gate. On this day, when this story starts, there were three cats sitting atop the wall, bathing in the summer sunlight. One was ginger and white, one was black and white, and one was a tabby cat. It should be noted that trolls don't fear cats, as many other foul beings do, but it's thought that this is simply because they're too stupid. Cats certainly detest trolls, and upon smelling the thick air that wafted from the direction of Throch, these three cats got up and walked off, no doubt to go and sleep on a feather bed somewhere in the castle. Each of the three gates in the great wall that surrounds the town was guarded by fifteen of the king's loyal guards. When they saw the eight-foot-tall troll stomping up to the gate, they rushed to fight it off. They would have killed him quite quickly, or at least fought him back to the woods away from the town. But Throch was cunning. When the first loyal guard strode up to Throch, who was investigating a piece of trout that had become lodged between the largest and second largest toes of his right foot eight days ago, he said, Oi, leave here, you filthy troll, or I'll slice open all eight of your stomachs. He shouted this at Throch, because most trolls are both dim-witted and partly deaf. Throch, however, had excellent hearing. He turned his head sharply, and a few pieces of brown-yellow straw fell off. This is a most rude thing to say, he gargled. I am just walking along this road, minding my own business. Be it rude or not, said the loyal guard, whose name was Cunward. You may not come to this town. And he raised his sword and pointed it at Throch to restate his earlier threat. And now you are threatening me with a sword, Throch said, quite calmly. And yet I have done nothing unlawful. Your presence here is unlawful, Cunward responded. And where is your evidence of that? Throch interjected, masterfully irate. Can you show me this law? Do you have it written on a piece of vellum in your hand? Unless you can prove to me right now that this is the law, then you have no right to threaten me with stomach cutting, and you have every right to simply walk along this road, harming no one. It's common knowledge that trolls may not enter towns, the loyal guard said hastily. And do you think that common knowledge is the same as law? Throch said as he towered over the guard. No? Well, then clearly you are being absurd. Why are you putting so much effort into harassing innocent businessmen, such as myself? Why aren't you doing anything to stop the Northumbrians who wander so freely through your gates? Now, this was clever of Throch. Most people hated the Northumbrians. They hated trolls more, of course. But the Northumbrian invasion three years before had left a resentment for those northern folk, some of whom came to the king's castle to trade. The Northumbrians are welcome here, Cunward began again. And yet they have attacked many of the towns along the border of the kingdom over the last few months alone. They have invaded before, and they will attempt to invade again. They would see this kingdom brought to ruin. The Northumbrians are savage, foul, and uncivilized. And yet they are allowed into this town, but my right to walk here is threatened. By this time, Many of the people who had been walking along the road, passing through the great stone wall, had stopped to watch and listen to the troll. Cunwed stumbled, and before he could respond to Throch, a second guard, whose name was Edward, and who was, incidentally, the fifth son of the fourth son of the brother of King Edric, and so a distant cousin of King Ethelred, stepped forward. He said, 
If we allow Northumbrians into our town, then I see no reason why we should not let this troll into our town, as long as he does not thieve or attack anyone. But he's a troll, Cunward said. Of course he will do as such. To which many of the townsfolk standing around the two guards and the one troll murmured in agreement. And yet the Northumbrians have attacked us far more than trolls have over the last few years, and we allow them into the town. Even more townsfolk grumbled in agreement to that. Northumbrians should be banned from entering the kingdom, Throch said. Any that come here should be cut in three. A few townsfolk cheered in agreement, but more said nothing. You may go about the town, troll, Edward said, so long as you obey the king's laws. Of course, of course. Throck grunted. Then go onwards, Edward said, standing aside to let the troll through the gate. And so Throck walked into the town. Throck walked along the busy main street, and after a way he came to a tavern. While he had lived in the countryside, by roads and under bridges, most of Throck's meals had been raw fish, frog spawn stew, roasted toads, and occasionally cold salted ham or mouldy bread. With the chance to eat fresher food, Throch shuffled into the tavern. When Throch pushed the heavy oak door to the tavern open with one hand, those already inside jumped off their seats, unaware that this particular troll had been permitted to enter the town. A blacksmith, who sat at a table in the corner of the tavern, said, Oi, leave here, you filthy troll, or I shall call upon the king's loyal guards to come and drain the grey blood from your veins. This is the most rude thing to say, he glugged. I have just come in here for a drink and some bread. I am just minding my own business. Be it rude or not, the blacksmith said, you may not come into this tavern. We want no trolls here. You will most likely try to steal from us. And now you are accusing me of a crime I have not committed, Throck said quite calmly. And yet I have done nothing unlawful. Your presence here is unlawful, the blacksmith said. On the contrary, Throck began, I have been given permission to go about the town freely, by the king's guards. That is true, said a young farmer, who had been in the crowd around the troll earlier. I can attest that this troll has been permitted to wander the town freely by the king's own men. You see? Throck said. I am an honest person, and yet this man, he said, pointing at the blacksmith with a gnarled, greasy finger and speaking to the whole room, has accused me of crimes I did not commit. I did not accuse you of committing a crime. Then you are saying that I have committed no crimes, Throch interjected. Yes, but... But what? You are accusing me of being a dishonest person, and yet I see that it is you who is dishonest. You must be a goldsmith. Only goldsmiths are so dishonest. I'm a blacksmith. <laughs> Have you thought about a change of craft? Throck said. Many around the tavern laughed. Your dishonesty would make you the perfect goldsmith. You could cheat people out of their gold by swapping it for fool's gold. Many more around the room guffawed. The blacksmith tried to respond, but he could not be heard over the raucous laughter. Throck ignored the blacksmith, and sat down at a squat table, his flabby arse swallowing the seat beneath him. The tavern keeper brought him a drink, placing it on the oak table at an arm's length to avoid breathing in the troll's sickly stench. A wealthy merchant from Essex came over to the troll. You are right about goldsmiths, the merchant said. They do so often cheat others out of their money. If the king had an assent, Throck began. He would have them all hanged for their dishonesty and their thievery. Indeed, the wealthy merchant said. You are most wise. Allow me to buy you your drink and this tavern's finest pork pie. You are most generous, Throck said. This kingdom needs more fine folk like you. The tavern keeper brought the troll a pork pie and bread and some sweet fruit cakes and much more food that the wealthy merchant paid for. Once Throch had finished eating, he lolloped out of the tavern and continued along the street. After a way, he came to the market square. Hundreds of carts stood on the golden stone of the square, 
as common folk from the lands around the castle had come to sell wheat, barley, leather and wool. They leapt back at the sound of the troll, his squelching arse and his clapping thighs, but they had already learned from the king's guards that the troll had been permitted to wander the town. Throch went from cart to cart, inspecting the items that each seller sold. He would pick the items up with his oily hands, turn them over several times, sniff them, and then drop them back onto the cart. Throch was never known to have had or spent any money, so most likely he had no intention of actually buying any of these items. Nevertheless, he went from cart to cart and befilthed the bread and vegetables, coats and armour on each. Knowing how strong the troll probably was, most of the sellers said nothing and just hoped the troll would move on as quickly as possible. Once he had passed, they quickly rinsed off the black mould he had smeared onto their goods. One seller, a grey-haired woman selling linens, would not stand for the troll doing this, however. When she saw the troll gradually moving along to her cart, as he was currently inspecting some pottery, she said, Oi! Get your filthy hands off these goods, you fetty troll! Go away! Leave this market and leave this town! Go back to the shitty puddle you came from! It is the most rude thing to say, the troll slept. I have just come to this market to see the fine pottery and jewellery produced by the most excellent people of this town. But now you are demanding that I leave the town, just because you are offended by my presence. Needless to say, there are many people who are offended by your presence too. No one wants to have to look at a grey, wrinkled old woman who is probably twice widowed like you. The market square was busy, and though none stood within three long paces of the troll, many townsfolk pressed against each other as they stood and watched the troll and the old woman. My husband is alive and well, the old woman said. <laughs> Your husband may be alive, but I doubt he's well with a bitch like you for a wife, Throck said. Several around the troll laughed out of surprise. I imagine he has suffered through a long depression being married to you. Why, if I had the misfortune of you as a wife, I would have killed myself years ago. That's rich coming from you, the old woman said. I imagine most people vomit at the thought of marrying you. Just feel smell, let alone your odorous words. Many in the audience around them agreed, of course, though none said so. A typical woman, Throck said. You are offended by my honest words, and yet I recall that it was you who tried to insult me first. Such hypocrisy. You are a typical old woman, bitter, self-centred and controlling. Two or three of those standing around the troll agreed loudly. The rest were silent. And you are a typical troll, the old woman retorted. You are arrogant, fat, foul... You see? Throck interjected. Once again, you are apparently allowed to say whatever you like to me, and I am apparently not allowed to speak truthfully to you. Such hypocrisy. Only women are known to be such hypocrites. A wealthy lord, who happened to have been passing through the market square with several of his own guards, and who had been standing among the crowd around the troll, stepped forwards before the old woman could respond. Let us not forget the king's law, the wealthy lord said. You may not like what someone says, but they are completely free to say it, he said to the old woman. This troll has been given permission to go about the town under the king's law. He may not be driven from it just because of something he's said. Unwilling to try to argue against a wealthy and powerful lord, the old woman said nothing, and the crowd around them began to disperse. The wealthy lord turned to the troll and said quietly, You are right about women. They take offence so easily, and they should not be allowed to participate in King Ethelred's great councils. If the king were not so easily swayed by the words of his queen, Throck said, he would order all women to remain silent unless asked to speak. Else her tongue be cut out and fed to pigs. Indeed, the wealthy lord said. You are most wise. Allow me to take you to my house, for as long as you stay in the town, you may stay there. And so the wealthy lord brought Throck to his house, which was a very large house close to the outer wall of the king's castle. The wealthy lord had many spare rooms and plenty more food. Throck took the room that he liked the most, 
and the Lord's servants brought the troll more to eat throughout the evening. The next day, when the troll awoke, the wealthy lord invited him to come to the king's castle. King Ethelred held a great council every week, at which any man or woman, be they noble or common, was welcome to attend and to speak. The king would listen to the plights of all, and use what he heard to make decisions for the good of the kingdom. A wise course of action, until it came to Throch. The wealthy lord and his guards walked through the gates of the king's castle to the great hall that King Ethelred had constructed for these councils. Throch tried to follow them. Halt, said one of the king's loyal guards, who stood by the gate. You may have been permitted to go about the town, troll, but you may not enter this hall. And why is this? Throch oozed. This is where folk, both common and noble, discuss ideas for the betterment of the whole kingdom. Doubtless the only ideas you will have are of theft and assault. And have you heard any of my ideas? The troll said. I have not, the guard responded. But you are a troll, and trolls only think about such things. So you are trying to silence me, yet you have not heard any of my ideas, Throck said. I have only been in this town for a day, and yet I have already met many people who agree with me. It seems you are just trying to silence a point of view that you don't like. Need I remind you that it is the king's law that anyone may say whatever they like without persecution? Are you trying to break the king's law? Of course not. Then you must allow people with different points of view to you to speak, and you must permit them to enter this hall. The loyal guard couldn't disagree with the troll. The troll had been permitted to go about the town, as long as he did not thieve or attack anyone. And indeed, the troll had not done so. While many had complained about what the troll had said thus far, the troll was within his rights within the king's law. Very well, the loyal guard said. You may enter the great hall and be part of the debate. And so Throch stomped into the great hall. The great hall that Ethelred had built for these great councils was, and still is, magnificent. The room within it is by far the longest in the kingdom, at a hundred yards. During these great councils, most of the common and noble folk sit or stand on the ground floor, which is paved with marble, but there is more space on a first floor balcony, where yet more common and noble folk stand side by side. At the far end is a dais, where the king and his ministers sit and listen to all. Thousands of people were already inside the great hall when Throch came in. Upon smelling Throch's thick, floral scent, those standing around him pushed up against the walls of the hall, so as to stand at least five long paces away from the foul troll. Those who came in after the troll were careful to step over the moist, shitty stains the troll left on the floor. King Ethelred, who was already seated on the throne upon the dais, had sharp eyesight and saw the troll from the far end of the room. His loyal guards had already told him of the troll's presence within the town, and the king had agreed that so long as the troll did not break any laws, the troll could go about the town as he liked. Indeed, King Ethelred wondered that if trolls didn't break any laws at all, was there really any problem with them? The king's herald called the great council to order, and all in the hall were silent. King Ethelred stood, his great red cloak swayed, and the gold crown upon his head glinted in the sunlight that pierced the high windows of the hall. I welcome you all to this great council, the king said. A king must have advisers, and surely the more advisers a king has, the better his decisions can be. Good ideas can come from anyone. Thus, you are all my advisers, and I welcome all of your ideas. Speak now of your plights, and what must be done to resolve them. Your Majesty, a carpenter said, I come from a small town twelve leagues to the west of here. In recent months, we've seen many Britons from the west come to our lands. The harvests of recent years have not provided them with the food they need. These people need food, water and somewhere to sleep, but we cannot provide this to them ourselves. Would your majesty send extra provisions to the west of the kingdom so that these newcomers may not starve? The king was about to respond. He looked as though he was going to agree with the carpenter, and his scribe was already writing down the request. But before King Ethelred could respond, Throch spoke. I don't see why we should help these people, he spat. 
The Britons would not do the same for us if we had need of their help. They are not our problem, and we should not give our precious food to them. Many in this kingdom, too, have suffered over the past two years. We don't have the food to give. Many around the troll agreed. That is untrue, the carpenter said. We've had many good harvests over the last few years. We have the food to... You do not deny the fact that the Britons would not give us food if we went to them and asked for it. The Britons are savage, foul and uncivilized. If we give them this food and water, they would see this kingdom as weak and would immediately invade. The same people around the troll agreed with him again. It does not matter if... The carpenter began. It does not matter if they invade! The troll exclaimed. I think there are many people who've had to fight off invaders over the years who would disagree with you. The same people around the troll agreed with him a third time. No, it does not matter if they would do this. The carpenter began again. Any Briton that crosses the border into this kingdom should be cut in three. The troll shouted. Many around the troll were shocked by the troll's remark and called for the troll to leave. Your Majesty... The carpenter began again, turning to the king. This is ridiculous. Why has this troll been allowed into this hall? What's ridiculous is that apparently you can't listen to the opinions of people who disagree with you. <laughs> apparently anyone's allowed to speak in this hall as long as they speak the right words. That is not what I said. That's exactly what you said. You're offended and you don't like being offended, so you don't want the people around you to say the things that offend you. This is hardly in concurrence with the king's law. Your Majesty, I must agree with the troll, one of the king's guards said before the carpenter could respond. The guard's name was Edward, the same guard that Throch had met when he first arrived at the gates of the town. He has done nothing unlawful, and he must be permitted to speak freely, as we all are. He should not be thrown from this great hall simply because we disagree with him. I agree that this troll has the right to speak freely, under my own laws, the king said to his distant cousin. But this opinion is very different to what most people in this hall seem to think on the matter. Why should we spend time discussing ideas that most here would not ever imagine doing? Your Majesty, that is exactly why we should listen to what this troll has to say. If we are all speaking the same words, where do the new ideas come from? Furthermore, while some in this hall do not agree with the troll, there are clearly also many who do. Very well, the king said. The troll may remain. Your Majesty, the carpenter began, you cannot seriously be considering doing what the troll says. Though we have fought the Britons many times over the last centuries, the people coming to our lands now are not our enemies. I have no intention of doing what this troll suggests, for you are right, these Britons are not our enemies. I will send as much wheat and barley as is necessary to the West to provide for them. However, all have the right to speak freely in this hall, and throughout my kingdom. I too disagree with the troll, but to throw him from this hall would go against my own decree. Therefore he must be allowed to stay and speak as he wishes, and we must all listen. Everyone in the hall agreed with the king. Throch said little throughout the remainder of the great council. Those who were there and who recount this story say that he seemed uninterested in the other matters brought to the king's attention. For the next week, Throch stayed at the house of the wealthy lord he had met in the market square. The troll was costly to keep. Servants brought him food constantly for twelve hours of the day. At first this was fine fruits and cakes, but after a few days the lord's servants realised that they could provide the troll with altogether less food if they gave him foods that were somewhat more difficult to eat. So they gave him fatty meats seasoned with mustard and rosemary. Trolls certainly do not become less disgusting when they are given beds to sleep on and baths to wash in. Many have told of how, for the time that the troll stayed at the Lord's house, the air in the street beside it smelled strongly floral and fungal. Some days Throch would spend his time doing nothing other than eating, shitting and sleeping, not leaving the Lord's house at all. Other days he would wander the town, causing just as much disruption as he had on the first day he was there. Though he never did any of the things that trolls are known to do often, such as threaten people into giving them things. He needed no more food, of course, not that trolls are ever known to be contented, but he did not steal any jewellery or perfume, nor did he attack anyone. King Ethelred saw this as a good sign. Perhaps some trolls were simply not as troublesome as most were, though he did notice the gifts that the wealthy lord and others were giving to the troll. 
A week later, and King Ethelred presided over the next great council. This time, Throch had no difficulty getting into the great hall. No one stopped him and no one questioned it. Throch also went to the great hall earlier in the day, and so stood much closer to the king's dais than he had done the week before. The king's herald called the great council to order, and all in the hall were silent. King Ethelred stood, his great red cloak swayed, and the gold crown upon his head glinted in the sunlight that pierced the high windows of the hall. I welcome you all to this great council, the king said. A king must have advisers, and surely the more advisers a king has, the better his decisions can be. Good ideas can come from anyone. Thus you are all my advisers, and I welcome all of your ideas. Speak now of your plights, and what must be done to resolve them. Many matters were brought to the king's attention. An increase in theft in Whitewater, a supposed dragon in the east that needed to be slain, and the need to rebuild several bridges across the Avon and the Churn. On all of these matters, Thra remained silent. After many had spoken, one of the king's own scholars spoke. Your Majesty, the scholar said, there is another matter that I would like to bring to your attention. Over the last eight years, we've observed a decrease in the amount of rainfall over late summer. It may be a good idea to build a series of reservoirs upstream on the Trent, to hold back some of the water from earlier in the year so that it may be used for irrigation later in the year. No one in the Great Hall raised an objection to this, and once again the King's scribe was about to write down the idea for the King to review later. When Throch spoke. What an outrageous proposal, Throch began. You would spend our money building reservoirs just to hold back the water we have a right to. People need that water, and who are you to say when and how they might use it? You should stay out of such things. It is for each man to decide for himself. Besides, I think we can all agree that there has been no shortage of water over the last few years. Why, over the last few months alone, it's rained almost every day. A few people in the hall, mainly lords and ladies, agreed with the troll. That's not what I said, the scholar replied. I said that there was less rain over late summer, not late spring and early summer. We've had plenty of rain over the last few months, but over the next few months, based on what we've seen... Everyone over... can see that there has been plenty of rain. Too much rain. There's no shortage of water. But if you tax people to build reservoirs, there will be a shortage of coin, Throch retorted. The same people in the hall agreed with the troll again. You are an idiot if you think that's what I'm oh, saying. I'm an idiot, am I? We're all idiots, are we? Just because we look to the skies and see rain. It's the typical arrogance of these so-called scholars. They think that they are so intelligent and that we are so stupid. They pretend that they are so knowledgeable because they are so educated. But they know nothing more than a common man and sometimes less. If these people are going to keep making false statements, their money should be taken from them and they should be thrown from the town. Many around the troll were shocked by the troll's remark and called for the troll to leave. Your Majesty, the scholar began, this is ridiculous. I know that the troll has the right to say what he likes, but every opinion he has is of attacking others. We have no need of such opinions. What's ridiculous is that apparently you can't listen to the opinions of people who disagree with you. <laughs> Apparently no one's allowed to speak in this hall as long as they speak the right word. That is not what I said. That's exactly what you said. You're offended and you don't like being offended, so you don't want the people around you to say the things that offend you. It is hardly in concurrence with the king's law. Your Majesty, I must agree with the troll, a wealthy merchant said. The same wealthy merchant who Thraw had met in the tavern the week before. He must be allowed to speak freely. Indeed, we must listen to what the troll has to say. I agree that this troll has the right to speak freely, under my own laws, the king said. But the decisions that I take must be just, and I will do no harm to those who have not earned it. Given that the troll's opinions differ from mine and most of those in this hall, why should we spend time discussing ideas that most here would not ever imagine doing? Your Majesty, that is exactly why we should listen to the troll. We cannot gain wisdom by listening to those we already agree with. We can only gain wisdom by listening to those we disagree with. Given that there are clearly many people in this hall who agree with the troll, I recommend that the troll be made a minister, so as to provide a balance of opinions among your ministers. Many in the hall were shocked at this suggestion. They murmured among themselves and shouted disapproval at the merchant. And they were right to be shocked. Until a week ago, no troll had ever set foot in the king's castle, 
yet now one might become a minister for the king. There is already balance among the opinions of my ministers, the king said. Clearly that is not your majesty, the merchant said, else the troll's opinions would not seem so unusual. King Ethelred thought on that for a moment, and then said, Very well, since there are many here who agree with the troll on this and other matters, the troll shall be a minister. There was yet more outrage in the hall as the king called for another chair to be brought onto the dais. The king raised a hand to call for silence in the hall as Throch, without saying anything, plodded forward to the dais and sat on the chair. The remainder of the great council was uneasy. Unlike the week before, Throch commented on almost every matter that was brought forth. Most of the time he was in favour of doing nothing. When solving the problem involved spending tax money, Throch was utterly outraged. He disagreed with the king's ministers on almost everything, and for every matter there was no resolution. The king's scribe could write down nothing other than to come to the matter again at the next great council. When normally King Ethelred might have decided upon a course of action that would swiftly resolve each problem, he was now persuaded to delay action, or take no action at all. The great council was called to an end once again. Those who left the great hall were malcontent, the very sort of malcontent that these great councils were intended to abate. Over the next week, Throch's life was very different, once again, to what it had been the week before. Throch continued to live in the house of the wealthy lord he had met eight days before, but now he was plied with even more rich food than he had been in the first week. Honey-glazed pork, ribeye beefsteak, blackberry jam tarts and clotted cream on bread. The wealthy lord spared no expense on the troll, even buying him eight bottles of perfume every day and chains of gold inlaid with rubies. For now the troll was a minister, and the lord had a voice on the royal court, where before he had not. Not only this, but many others seemed to forget the troll's flowery stench. Many visited the troll during the week, among them the wealthy merchant and Edward the guard who had spoken for Throch in the last two great councils. The troll was also often visited by those among the townsfolk who agreed with the troll's outrageous opinions. Only a small fraction of the total number of people in the town, but large enough to fill the street outside the wealthy lord's house. Every evening, Throch would stand outside the door to the house, on the stone steps, and speak to his followers, who grew more and more numerous each day. Throch said many of the same things to them that he said in the great councils. He called for any Northumbrians in the kingdom to be cut in three, and when the crowd cheered at that, he called for the king to march into Northumbria and take the lands for Mercia. He called for any woman who tried to speak over anyone else to have her tongue cut out, and when the crowd cheered that, he called for women to be banned from speaking entirely. Also unlike the previous week, Throch did not spend so much of the day at the house of the wealthy lord. Now that Throch was a minister, each day he went into the king's castle and sat with the other lords of the royal court at the great round table that Ethelred had built in the first year of his reign. There the king and his ministers would discuss the details of the affairs of state. Throch was far less fiery at these gatherings of the royal court than he was when he spoke to his followers in the evenings. He was sullen and uninterested. Most of what was said he did not comment on. When he did comment, it was only to dismiss ideas with little conviction. Indeed, many of the other ministers at those gatherings have told of how the troll did not seem particularly intelligent and could not grasp the complexities of the subjects. After another week had passed, King Ethelred held another great council. Hundreds of common folk shuffled into the great hall, many from around the town, but many who had come from towns far away in order to speak before the king. Throch lolloped into the great hall too, this time only once everyone else had arrived. He pushed his way through the crowd to the dais and sat upon his stained chair to the right of the king. The king's herald called the great council to order, and all in the hall were silent. King Ethelred stood, his great red cloak swayed, and the gold crown upon his head glinted in the sunlight that pierced the high windows of the hall. I welcome you all to this great council, the king said. A king must have advisers, and surely the more advisers a king has... Oh, we don't need to do all that again, Throch said loudly. Many gasped in shock. Had anyone interrupted the king during King Edric's or King Edrith's day, they would have had their tongue cut out. 
King Ethelred, ever patient and calm, however, did not mind. Very well, he said. Let us begin. Many matters were brought to the king's attention, but it took a long time to get through each one. Throch contested every point. He questioned the motivations of each speaker. He claimed that each person who spoke was motivated only by greed and spite. They sought only to enrich themselves at the expense of others. Whenever someone asked for extra food or water, or for bridges to be built or rebuilt, or for roads to be maintained, he argued that the king should not interfere with such matters, that it was for the people to do these things themselves. Throch many times called for the king to invade Northumbria or Essex or Sussex. Throch was adored by some and despised by others. With each remark he made, many of those in the great hall booed the troll, while his followers cheered loudly. In these times, the great councils of King Ethelred were very different to how they were previously, serene and direct. Nothing was decided upon. The king's ministers, not including Throch, grew more and more frustrated with each matter that was brought before the king. It took so long to debate each matter that the king cut the debate short each time so as to make progress. After many hours of debate, a young boy stepped forward to speak to the king. The boy was 14 years old. He had long, brown, wavy hair that was tied back with a red band. His skin was white and smooth, and his linen clothes had been embroidered with dragons and flowers, lions and swans. Your Majesty, the boy said, I come from the town of Chewsbury. There has been much theft in the town over the last few months, but we are unable to seize or fight off the thieves. Would your Majesty send some able fighters to the town to apprehend the thieves? Before King Ethelred was able to respond, Throch spoke. <laughs> what is going on here? He said, looking at the boy with a smirk of curiosity. The crowd could sense what was about to happen. Are you a boy or a girl? The crowd waited nervously. A boy? The boy said. <laughs> well, you certainly don't look like one. Some among the crowd laughed hard at the troll's remark. The rest remained silent. Why are you wearing girls' clothes? The troll asked. I'm not, the boy said. Oh, please! What kind of boy wears clothes with so much embroidery on them? And is your hair braided? The same people among the crowd laughed hard again. What in all the land does that have to do with the boy's question? One of the king's other ministers asked. Well, quite a laugh, it would seem. If this boy or girl, or whatever it is, can't defend itself from a few thieves, then clearly it cannot be a boy as it claims to be. That still has nothing to do with the boy's question, which was whether the king can send some men-at-arms to Tewsbury to apprehend these thieves, the king's other minister retorted. Clearly the boys and men of Tewsbury are not truly boys and men at all, Throch said, to cheers and shouts and jeers and boos from those within the hall. They are weak! Why should they depend on their king to deal with such matters? If they can't deal with thieves on their own, then they are weak, and they deserve everything they get. It is the king's duty to defend This his... is clearly the result of Saxon influence. This is what happens when you let Saxons take your land. All of the men and boys start thinking they are women and girls. By this point, Throch himself was shouting over the clamour of the crowd in the Great Hall. The Saxons would have us destroy our kingdom from within Throck shouted. They must be driven from the land. This is the only way to preserve the civility of the Angles and the Britons. The king, who had been listening intently, turned towards Throck. Britons, he said. Yes, the troll replied. When it was just the Britons and the Angles in this part of Albion, it was a far more civilized place. But you said the Britons were savage, foul, and uncivilized, the king said. King Ethelred had an excellent memory, and could remember just about everything anyone said. The crowd became quieter again. So? So how can you think both of these things at the same time? They are contradictory. <laughs> it doesn't matter, the troll said loudly. Consistency is not important. 
And in that moment, King Ethelred the Wise realised what the troll was doing. In that moment, he was finally able to see through the troll's cunning. Throch didn't say the things that he said because he believed them. He said them because they got a reaction. Throch had no interest in trying to resolve any of the matters brought before the king. He simply said outrageous things in order to keep the attention on himself. For as long as the attention was on Throch, the troll would keep being given fine food, clothing, jewellery and perfume. That was what the troll wanted. King Ethelred turned to his loyal guards. Seize him. The king's loyal guards rushed towards the troll, spears in hand. Within a moment he was surrounded. How dare you! Throch shouted at the king. For the first time irate but not in control. Remove him from this hall, the king said. That is utter hypocrisy! The troll shouted. He turned to the crowd. This is persecution! By a king's own decree, I may say what I like without persecution! He turned back to the king. You are just trying to silence an opinion you don't like! By your own admission, you will say one thing one moment, and it's opposite the next. Perhaps the things you say are indeed your opinions, perhaps they are not. We have no way of knowing if anything you have ever said is truly your opinion. How can I possibly be trying to silence a point of view when we don't even know what that point of view is? You have no interest in solving the problems that are brought before me in this hall. That is the entire point of these great councils, to make decisions for the betterment of the kingdom. It is entirely a waste of time to have anyone in such a council who does not believe that the suggestions they are making are correct. You say the things you say to provoke outrage. Outrage brings you attention. Attention brings you gifts. You are manipulating the debate for attention. That is your entire purpose here. I have the right to say what I like! Yes, you do, the king replied. But you do not have a right to any audience of your choosing. And so the king's skilful men-at-arms forced the troll from the hall with spear and sword. Throch continued screaming about his right to speak and his alleged persecution as he was driven backwards. Everyone else in the hall was silent as the troll was removed, including his former supporters, Edward, the wealthy merchant, and the wealthy lord. Though Throch was eight feet tall and five times as heavy as the king's heaviest guardsman, Throch was not ferocious in his fight back against the king's men-at-arms. He swiped at them a few times, but when he cut his arms on their spears, his vanity, for Throch thought himself truly beautiful and did not want to scar his skin, prevented him from holding his ground. Throch was driven from the Great Hall, and then from the King's Castle, and then from the town that surrounded the castle, back out through the same gate he had entered through. King Ethelred followed his skilled men-at-arms a few paces away as this happened, and his people followed behind him. Once the king's men-at-arms had fought the troll back through the gate onto the road south of the town, they stopped and formed a wall of themselves. I have the right to enter the town! No, you don't, the king said. You have a right to say what you like and not be persecuted for it, and you may do that here. On the roads of my kingdom you may say whatever you like, and no one may strike or kill you for it. But you may not come to this town nor any other town in my kingdom. Throch continued shouting at the king, and even called for him to be overthrown. But the king turned, and walked back to the castle, with his people behind him. The king's loyal guards stayed at the gate, spears in hand, to ensure that the troll did not come back into the town. Throch stayed outside of the town for many days. At first, his supporters who had previously come to hear the troll speak outside the lord's house, came to listen to the troll outside the walls of the town. But with each passing day, fewer and fewer came, as each began to notice more and more contradictions in the things Throch said, and as each saw that all Throch truly wanted was fine clothes, jewellery and perfume. Many came to the town from lands far away who had not heard the troll speak before, and some were enamoured with the troll's words. 
When they asked why the troll was not allowed into the town, however, the townsfolk explained all that had happened, and the newcomers too began to see through the troll's words, and see what he truly wanted. As fewer and fewer people came to listen to the troll, Throch became bored, and wandered away again. And after this, not much more is known of Throch. He went back to harassing lords and ladies along the roads, and while there were some who still supported him, as he had been banished from the towns of the kingdom, he was of little use to them. Aside from this, Throch was never seen or heard of again, and it's assumed that at some point he died in a ditch. The reign of King Ethelred the Great after that was, for the most part, a peaceful and prosperous one. Throch had caused many problems for the king. In the weeks when the troll was part of the king's great councils and when he was one of the king's ministers, many actions that would have been taken weren't. But the king, in his wisdom, was eventually able to see the troll's true intentions. If only the king had not trusted the troll to begin with, it would all have been avoided. King Ethelred learned that both fame and infamy had their rewards, and that sometimes those rewards were all that someone wanted, regardless of how they got them. He learned that by allowing the troll to speak so often in the Great Hall, far more than any other one person, and by making the troll a minister, he had given the troll more attention, and that was what the troll had wanted. Throch had manipulated the king into giving him more attention. And ultimately, King Ethelred learned the most important thing about trolls. Don't trust them. Don't listen to them, don't talk to them, don't give them any attention. To put it simply, don't feed the trolls. <laughs>